Today, we have a very, very special guest, and thanks for listening. We have Jim Shalek. He is running for attorney general. The election is tomorrow, which is Tuesday, 7-19, July 19th. If you're in Maryland, definitely get out and vote whether you're voting in the Republican primary, which we're going to be speaking about in just a second, or even the Democratic primary, it's important for all of us to go out and do our civic duty and go out and vote. But anyways, Jim, thanks so much for coming on, and we appreciate that you're running for Attorney General. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So let's kick this around, Jim. Uh, And some of these are going to be audience questions. I mixed them in with some of the questions that I personally wanted to ask you. So we'll start out with an audience question from a conservative viewer. And they are writing to say, as far as the first question, would you consider yourself a Trump Republican, a conservative, or a moderate? I'm a a conservative. I'm I'm a conservative Republican. And in terms of Trump, you know, I thought he did some great things. I wish he was president now. So does many people listening and many people around the country in general. Yes. (laughs) But uh, we'll keep moving into this. So you are running in the primary against a person that's uh, pro-secession, Christian fundamentalist guy. He seems like he's pretty dangerous. He's really out of the mainstream as far as conservative ideals and ideas in general. How dangerous would it be to nominate somebody like this, especially in a state like Maryland, where most people are either Democrats or very moderate? Well, I mean, the concern that I have and other candidates have is that Maryland is a very liberal uh, blue state. And, uh, you know, some of his arguments may have appeal in a Republican primary. But what I'm worried about is the general election. Mm. You know, he's very conservative and Maryland is not. But we'll see what happens. Right. And, and I agree. And I've looked at your platform. That's why we actually did ask your opponent to come on. Uh, we never heard back. Uh, we like to give everybody equal time, as I did ask Anthony Brown and also Miss O'Malley to come on. And you were the only one responded. So apparently they don't have the, I'll say it, the cojones to come on (laughs) here and get asked the tough questions. And you do. So we appreciate you coming on. And as we keep going into the interview, again, for people that are listening, the election tomorrow, as far as the primary, is in Maryland. Uh, We are talking uh, to Jim Shalek. He's running for attorney general of the state of Maryland. So if you are a voter in Maryland, but especially in the Republican primary, uh, Jim is talking to you tonight. But also, if he wins the nomination tomorrow, he's talking to all the viewers here that are listening from Maryland. As we keep going into this interview, Jim, can you talk about the differences you have between yourself and your opponent? I know you spoke about that you feel like he's a little bit too extreme for a liberal state like Maryland, but, you know, go back and forth about some of the differences that you have between each other. Well, the main difference I have with him and the two Democrats running is that my, my platform, my priority will be to help reduce crime, period. And I don't hear that from any of the other three candidates. Crime is eating our society up. And I have the background and experience and the plan to make that a priority for the attorney general. And that, that sets me aside from the other three candidates. Jim, I know you lived in New York and you were a prosecutor up there. I'm from Rhode Island originally. We were a hop, skip, and a jump from New York, three hours. I have a lot of friends that are in policing in New York City still and some that are retired. And they talk about these issues, but these issues are not just geared to New York or Maryland or Florida, where I am right now, they're good to every state in the country. Crime has went out of control. So let's kick this around. Why do you feel like there is so much crime at this time in our nation's history? Because they're not punished hardly enough. Uh, There's a philosophy with a lot of district attorneys around America that the victim uh, should be given more compassion and uh, treatment then, I mean, the defendant should be given more consideration and treatment and sympathy than, than the, uh, the victim. Well, Jim, we even saw in New York the other day, the, the owner of the bodega was a Hispanic man. He was getting robbed by an African-American guy. 
and he ended up killing the guy. The guy was robbing him in the bodega, and that guy went to jail. I mean, this is what you're talking about, the district attorney in New York. I know we're talking about different states now, but this is not just going on in New York. This is going on all over the country. No question about it. There's no question about it. We In Maryland, we have at least two or three uh, local prosecutors. Here, they call them uh, state's attorneys. In New uh -huh. York, they're district attorneys. Right. And, that's, and you know, they're, they're basically soft on crime. And uh, I'm going to change that. You know, when we get into what my plan is, I'll, I'll tell you how we can do it. It's not complicated. You know, I, I want to go into your plan and we'll go into that in just a second. But I just got to answer this question. When we think of Maryland, we obviously think of the city of Baltimore. It has a lot of good things. We, you know, we think of the Ravens, the Orioles. Uh, there's, you know, yeah. some cultural sites downtown that are beautiful. But once you get out of that small area downtown, there's some rough in tough places in Baltimore, and specifically West Baltimore, where there's been some really scary issues, gang violence, murders up and down uh, that area. You know, how can you, if you do win that race in the primary, but then also go on to beat the two Democrats for the attorney general spot, really try to put policies in place to really tamp down this area of West Baltimore, which is really out of control out of probably, you know, the majority of the state in general. Well, you've got your finger right on the issue and you seem to know a lot about Baltimore. They had over 350 murders last year. Yeah. I mean, that's inexcusable. Graceful. I mean, the, the area you're talking about down by the waterfront, the harbor is nice. And they, they did a nice job in building that up. But once you move away from the downtown, the crime is rampant. And, uh, what I want to do, I don't, I don't know if this is the right time to just tell you what my plan is. Yeah, please. Well, first of all, my background, because I know what I'm talking about. I moved to Maryland 32 years ago to work as a prosecutor in the Justice Department. Before that, I came from the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Yep. I came from New York, and I was an assistant attorney general of New York State uh, for about six years. Prior to that, I was an assistant district attorney, assistant DA in the Bronx, New York. No better place to learn how to be a prosecutor than the Bronx, New York. Back then, we had 50,000 arrests a year, mm -hmm. about 435 murders a year. I was in a DA's office in the Bronx for 12 years. Ten of those years, I was in the Homicide Bureau, trying murder cases, manslaughter cases, the worst of the worst. Yeah. I was promoted to chief of homicide of the Bronx, one of five chief of homicides in New York City. I supervised about 20 lawyers and maybe 80 detectives in the prosecution and investigation of over 400 murders a year. So I know what I'm talking about. I've seen evil as close as you can get. I've seen it, what it does to families. I prosecuted David Berkowitz, the mm -hmm. son of Sam Killer, for three murders in the Bronx. So I know what evil can do. I know the sound. I know the sound a mother makes when I had to tell her that her child was murdered. And uh, that never leaves you. And that's my motivation. I see what crime does to families. From the second they open their eyes in the morning to the second they close their eyes at night. They're not thinking about climate change, the price of gas, no. They're thinking about the empty chair at the dinner table where their child should be sitting. So that's my background. I've got a background in crime and I'm dedicated to helping fight crime. Now, the Attorney General in Maryland is an army, about 460 lawyers, another five or 600 investigators, clerks, admin. It's an army. I want to use that army to help fight crime. The present Attorney General and past Attorney Generals, they basically perform civil functions representing all the state agencies. So, what am I going to do? Here's my plan I'm going to take about 10% of the lawyers maybe 45, 50 lawyers, and create a major offense bureau, criminal prosecution only. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into like Baltimore City, Prince George's County, other counties where they're overwhelmed, the state's attorney, they don't have the resources, or they don't have the will to take on the most violent and repeat offenders. So when that happens, my lawyers will be in those counties to replace or take over those cases using the army we have to do it. 
And with them, no plea bargaining, no deals. You're targeted by my bureau, no plea bargaining, no deals. We go all the way, one at a time, to take off the streets the most violent and repeat offenders. And why have an attorney general's office if you can't help reduce crime? And I've got the army to do it. Right. So that's my plan. It's simple and uh, it's very simple to uh, put in place. Take the worst of the worst and also repeat offenders. You steal your 14th car, it's time to go to jail. So that's my plan. And uh, I think it'll work. It sends a message. And as long as some of these bad people are in jail, we're safer for that period of time. So that, that's my platform. The other candidates, they talk about a million issues, a lot of important issues. But to me, that family at the kitchen table, that's my priority. Right. And I'm going to do everything I can to reduce crime. And Jim I hope Sh the voters agree. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Jim Shalek here running for Attorney General of Maryland in the Republican primary here on Fire, Breathe, and Rob. The election is tomorrow. If you are listening from Maryland, please go out and vote. Uh, it's your civic duty in general. Uh, again, the election is tomorrow, 7-19, July 19th, uh, for people listening. You know, you talked a lot about this, and I agree. You know, crime is rampant. We do have some people, and I know you said after the 14th time, I agree with you. If somebody steals something, they should have, you know, they should be in prison before the 14th time. But that's besides the point, Jim. My question is, is what happens to these guys that, you know, they're arrested, they're smoking marijuana, you know, maybe they're in doing cocaine. I'm not standing up for these drugs. Uh, you know, everybody has their own opinion on these drugs. Uh, personally, I've never done any drugs in my life. <laughs> I was brainwashed in Catholic school <laughs> as, as a, a young guy going to Catholic school K through 12. But enough about me. What, what would you tell these people that do get arrested for marijuana or cocaine? Are we going to just try to send these people, if, even if they get arrested two or three times, to drug counseling, but yeah, if it becomes a big problem where they're selling to young kids or something like that, yeah, then you got to kind of take the next step and send them to jail. Or would you just send them to jail right away after the first time? No, no, I, I agree with you 100%. You know, I'm not okay. a till of the hunt, you know, the bad guy. I'm not a till of the hunt. Young offenders, veterans with mental scars, drug addicts, people with mental illness, we don't want them to go to jail if we don't have to. We want them to be deferred out of the system, counseling, mm -hmm. drug treatment, uh, community service, therapy. Yeah, you know, we don't want young people to go to jail if we don't have to. But obviously it's what they, you know, the crime they commit and how many times. But the people you're talking about, I, you know, I, they, don't, they shouldn't be in jail. But at the end of the spectrum, the most violent and repeat, and I've seen it. I mean, you know, I, I, I've seen it. I've seen a nine-year-old girl raped, her throat cut ear to ear and thrown in a dumpster. And when we found her, she was half eaten by rats. So that's what I have in my head. That person should never yeah. see the light of day. I, agree. I mean, I, I know it sounds dramatic, but I, I've lived it. And until you've lived it, you know, people just kind of like, oh, yeah, it's a story. Until, you know, they take a break and they get a sandwich during the show. Not me. And that's, that motivates me to run. That, that's got to stop. These families are destroyed. And, you know, we all watch it on TV and, and uh, it's time to go to the bathroom or get a sandwich for most people, thank God. But the ones that are impacted, we've got to, it's got to stop. It's got to stop. Yeah, Jim, there's a lot of sick people out there. I agree. Yep. And we need to put those people away. There's some people you can rehabilitate, like we said, with the drug offenders or yep. the minimal crimes, you know, petty theft, stuff like yep. that. You can get to some of those people. Yes. But when it starts to get to these other crimes where there's murder or even things that are even worse than that, uh, then you have, those people need to be put away. And you're not going to get to some of those people. Uh, you know, it's a big, big increase here in, in homicides, but carjackings, home burglaries, yeah. home invasions. That Just think about somebody, you know, in your kitchen at three in the morning with a machete. Yeah. You know, things like, I mean, it's not some a of these joke, events, yeah. no, they're, life, they're life events that you never get over as a, as a family, as a, as a victim. Yeah, so we've I got agree. to do something. Yeah, my, my family. Yeah, go ahead. 
No, I'm just saying, and, and the attorney general's office has, it's an army, almost 500 lawyers, 500 more in So let's use that army to help fight crime. I'm only gonna take 10% of the office and convert it into a prosecution unit. And I'm hoping the state's attorneys, the local prosecutors will welcome my office. We don't wanna have fights with the state's attorney. We wanna assist them. But if they don't uh, cooperate, I'll have them removed if I can. As far as in Maryland, as attorney general, what would you do as far as funding the police, you know, putting more money toward the social programs, which they want to do, or would you just, you know, just leave it as it is, I guess? No, it, when they first started with the defund the police, to me, it was like insane. How can you, how can you defund and eliminate police officers? They're, they're, they're the wall between us and anarchy and crime. I mean, how can you possibly defund or remove police? It's an insane concept. But, you know, we, you know, we can't, you know, we don't want to have uh, tanks on our streets either. I mean, we want to open society, but police need the funding and the manpower they need and uh, they deserve. And they don't get any respect anymore. I tell you, a police officer gets out of his car or her car, three things can happen and they're all bad. One, you can get shot and killed. Mm -hmm. Two, you can get a complaint against you by a citizen who's got, everybody's got a phone. Or three, management watches everything you do. You can get in trouble with management because you, 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 know, you lost your notebook. So I feel for these men and women. You know, they're, the minute they get out of the car, they're screwed, basically. And well, they I, got I, the courage I, to do it. I agree with you, Jim, but I want to get into this. And this is, I asked that question, but one of our, uh, viewers also wanted to throw this into that question too and you kind of just brought it up with the tanks because we have seen in the past you know going back to when Barack Obama was in office with the Ferguson issue there was tanks on the street you know a lot of these police have all kinds of military weapons yeah. uh, you know so the the funding is where I agree with you, but the question is, is where are we putting this money to fund the police? Is it to give them all these military style weapons, these tanks, you know, because that's not really going to be good funding to me. I think the funding needs to be so the police get better pay, but also, you know, they have the materials, but they don't need tanks on the street. I mean, we're not in Iraq or Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah, I think that would, that's a little too much even though these neighborhoods are bad, you know, you know, rough and tough places like West Baltimore, like Ferguson, a Chicago, but still we don't need tanks on the street. No, no, I agree. <laughs> You'd love to get a tour of the police department in New York City. When I was there, they had about 30,000 officers, but they had gunships, helicopters <laughs> with gun turrets, uh, tanks, bomb, bomb detonate. I mean, the New York City Police Department, and other, it's an army, literally. Yeah gunships like in vietnam i mean uh <laughs> helicopters with gun turrets i mean it's but I no you're know. right no you're right it has to be moderate it has to be reasonable but it has to be there right yeah. i agree i mean unfortunately in in some circumstances and we see it on tv too often sometimes the only way to end a situation is by deadly force unfortunately you're not yeah. a policeman but this person is also asking we saw what happened in Uvalde where there was 300 offices and all these kids still died. How can we trust police? This is the case that they're saying that they should have either open carry or they should have concealed weapons permits, not like what happened in New York with the governor. And I know that's a different state, but that's what they're getting at also. So what would you say to that person that talking about Uvalde with the 300 offices that were hanging around over there and all these kids died, teachers died and, you know, nothing happened. People were just hanging around like nothing was going on. Well, to me, that was a failure of leadership management. You know, officers are like soldiers. They follow orders. And apparently the breakdown was with management who was in charge and what orders were they giving? There was a lot of confusion. I don't blame the individual officers. They just follow orders. If, mm -hmm. if, some, if a superior said go, charged a classroom, they would have. Uh, so I think it was a failure of management and leadership. Uh, in terms of weapons, you know, I believe, I, I support the Second Amendment. 
mm -hmm. you know, there is lawful reasons people should have weapons. You know, someone has got a small business that closes up at midnight and takes the money home for them. I mean, there, there is a need for weapons and uh, the constitution allows for it. You know, um, it's a delicate question. It's a delicate question, but I saw, I, I fall on the side of the police in terms of what they need. Last question on policing. As far as qualified immunity, where do you stand on that? Well, I, I support the overall concept, you know, that uh, certain people in government, because they're acting on behalf of the government, mm -hmm. you know, should not be civilly, you know, sued for their actions in a, in a public servant way. Like judges can't be sued. Congress, you can't be sued for what you say on the floor of the Congress. So there should be some immunity for an officer. Otherwise, they'd never get out of their cars. Right. Anybody who was arrested would sue them for being arrested. Mm -hmm. So there should be some immunity for officers that are acting lawfully in the scope of their employment. Obviously, if a, there's a rogue cop that's stealing drugs or planting guns on kids, there should not be any immunity. You know, there has to be a, a determination. But overall, in, in the performance of your job, lawful performance of your job, you should be protected from lawsuits. Otherwise, every arrest, you'd be sued. You know, every every uh, case that the, you seize drugs or a weapon, you'd be sued. So there's got to be some protection for officers in their lawful execution of their duties. But Jim, you would work on that with, uh, yes. you know, the state in general to make sure, yes, I agree with you, you know, with certain situations, yes, you should have that immunity but like you said in those situations we go back to the george floyd situation back there that you know those cops that were standing around I, like i said i have some good friends that are former nypd cops they worked 35 years there they said if that guy did that they would have jumped on the guy and knocked him down uh right. to make sure he didn't kill that george floyd so right you know in those cases we need to make sure we take these like you said these rogue, rogue guys down See, the, the problem is in today's society, with discussions like we're having, mm -hmm. they, they, become, they become very uncivil. Yeah. You know, you got people that hate cops, people that love right. cops, people that, are, you know, feel that nobody should be in jail and others, everybody should be in jail. So we have a real right. ugly situation in America. Elections are ugly. Debates about uh, pro-life, pro-choice, pro-Second Amendment, they're, 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 they've really well, gotten ugly and... and Everybody's well, Jim, I blame that on social media, the media in general, mainstream media I'm talking about, that has pumped all these issues up, and that's why people hate each other. You know, just going back 21 years ago to when 9-11 happened, you know, we, yeah. we came together as a country, whether right. you liked Bush or not. You know, a yeah. lot of these people didn't like President Bush. Right. But you came together for the country, for the common good that, you know, we're all citizens of this country. But we all support the flag. We all support the soldiers, the firemen, the policemen, uh, everybody that was down there uh, in New York, in Pennsylvania, in Washington, D.C., to support all these people that passed away and died on that day. And if that, ha you know, I thought that that was going to be what coronavirus was in this country, and it it wasn't. It was, well, we hate Trump. He's, he, he's a blowhard. He's making up all this bullshit. It's just really disgusting in plain English. And uh, the last couple of questions are on abortion. And this is another hot button topic. I personally think everybody should be pro-life. I don't think that people, <laughs> I, I try to think as a person that's, you know, a Catholic, a Christian, uh, that people don't think that, hey, I want to kill a baby today. I think that unless they're mentally ill. <laughs> uh, but besides the point, uh, I think everybody's pro-life. I'm a guy that should be rape, incest, and obviously life of the mother. Is that what type of guy you are as far as, uh, you know, the exceptions? Or are you more just fully pro-life? Or, you know, is there any exceptions? What is it? Yeah, I'm, I'm pro-life, uh, certainly in the case of an imminent risk of death or serious injury to the mother. Um, and in terms of rape and incest, I, I probably would, would find exceptions for those too. Okay. 
You know, right. it, it's it's a horrible thing. I mean, it, it's it's a terrible issue, and I, and I I I realize the pain that women have that are pro-choice. I mean, it's not a pleasant. It's not like an issue where you can be happy that the other side lost. You know, it's you know I feel the pain of these women. You know. But that said, you know, can you give us your final statement to the voters that are listening from Maryland? of why they should go out and vote for you tomorrow on election day? Well, thank you. And thanks for having me. I really enjoyed this discussion, uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, if you elect me, voters of Maryland, which I'd be honored, I will do everything I can to help reduce crime. I mean, that that's my platform, that's my goal. Uh, it's got to stop these murders and these, these uh, horrible crimes. And the attorney general's office, it's a, an army of a thousand people. I'd be derelict if I didn't use that office, that army, to help reduce crime. It's that simple. There's a lot of other functions the attorney general's office will, will do. And we'll have 400 or so lawyers to do it. So nothing's going to be neglected. But crime has to be addressed. And uh, that's what I'm going to do. That's my priority. That's, that's what the attorney general's office is going to do. Try and keep you safe. And that's why I hope people vote for me. I appreciate that. Uh, again, for people that are listening, that was Jim Shalek. Again, jimshalek.com. It's G, uh, J-I-M, sorry. As I'm, I, I told you, Jim, I'm, I'm starting to sound <laughs> like Joe Biden every 10 <laughs> seconds now. It, it's J-I-M-S-H-A-L-L-E-C-K.com. Uh, if you get by the primary, Jim, love to have you on to really talk and and we know that the person running against Jim, I don't think they're very good for Maryland. That's my personal opinion. I'm, you know, Jim didn't pay me to say that. I'm just saying from my personal opinion, the person that's running against Jim seems like they're way out of uh, the mainstream of Maryland voters in general. And I think Jim is a person that can really work with Democrats and Republicans to get the job done. So, Jim, uh, we hope that, you know, you come out on top tomorrow and Thank then you. we'll have you on again throughout the general election. We appreciate your time tonight and go out and vote if you're in Maryland, please. Yes. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this. I appreciate it very much. All right. Thank, thank you. you, Jim. We hope to have you on again. Thank you very much.